What if of your life go? We're royal priests. Amen? So let the what ifs of your life go. Let them go. We don't want to keep hang on to the what ifs, do we? Way back in the Old Testament, way, way back, the people, God called the people of Israel and he called them to be a special people to him. Very special people to him. Way back. God called the people of Israel to be a very special people to him, but we know that they disobeyed. And they suffered terrible consequences because of their disobedience. But what if, what if they had obeyed? Do you have some what ifs in your life? What if? Do you have some, some what ifs in your life that you really can't get out of your mind? What if I had have studied harder at school? What if I hadn't have taken that drug? What if I had married that person who asked me to marry them? What ifs? Do you have what ifs in your life? Well, today you will hear that whatever your big what if is in life, it, you can say goodbye to that what if. Amen. You can say goodbye to it and I pray that you will say goodbye to it because if you walk with Jesus Christ, if you are a royal priest, wow, you have arrived Amen. where God wants you to be. Never mind the what if. Say goodbye to the what if. But what if Israel had been obedient? What was promised then? Let's have a look. Do you know what God promised the people of Israel would be if they were obedient? Let's read. If you want to open your Bibles or just look on the screen at Exodus 19, verses 5 and 6. Now therefore, God says to Israel, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, covenant then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people for all the earth is mine and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation oh what if because sadly we don't see this being true of the people of Israel over the years and especially today no the people of Israel have largely rejected Jesus as the Son of God, rejected Yeshua, their Savior, as the Son of God. And they have suffered holocaust after holocaust. But what if they had obeyed, they would have been a special treasure to God above all people, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, and I'm sure they would have been that today. Why? Uh, have they suffered all these things because they broke the condition? Look at verse 5. What was the condition? If you will indeed obey. They disobeyed to the extreme. Even calling for the death of Yeshua, Jesus their Savior. As, as Pilate said he wanted to release them. They rejected Jesus with a curse and saying, His blood be upon us. And upon our children. children. That was in Matthew 27, 25. And we see in Matthew 21, we see some of the consequences for the nation of Israel because of what happened. That disobedience. And we see in Matthew 21, 23, Now when he came into the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people confronted him. So here we have the rulers, the chief priests, and the elders of this nation of Israel confronted him. Jesus said to them, verse 42, Have you never read in the scriptures, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone? That's Jesus, that's Yeshua. This was the Lord's doing, 
and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. And whoever falls on this stone will be broken. But on whomever it falls, it will grind him to powder. So we see this was spoken to the representatives of Israel. Who was that nation whom the kingdom of God would be transferred to? From the people of Israel to this nation that we read, read there and read, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. Who is this nation? Is it England? Is it Germany? Is it France? Is it, is it Britain and, and America? No, 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 it's not. Who then is that nation that yes. the kingdom was taken from Israel and, and given to? Who would become a, a, a and, and did the promise, did the promise, of being a special treasure, a holy nation, a kingdom of priests, did that pass to that nation? We find a clear answer in 1 Peter chapter 2. You might want to open your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 2, or it will be on the screen, but we'll be in 1 Peter 2 a lot today. And in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 to 2, we see it's written to the elect. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the elect, verse 2, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Verse 4 now. So listen if you see a clear answer of who this promise and the kingdom was transferred to. Coming to him as to a living stone. That's Christ. A living stone. Rejected indeed by men but chosen by God and, and precious. That's Christ. That's our Saviour. You also, verse 5, this is, this, is, this, is, this is Christian. This is the elect that he's writing to in verse 1. You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house with a temple of God, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And we read on in verse 6. Therefore, it is also contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Don't worry about your what ifs. He who believes in him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious. Who's precious? Amen. Jesus is precious. But to those who are disobedient, and we read about the disobedience of Israel, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble being disobedient to the word to which they were. They were also appointed, but you are a chosen generation. You are a chosen generation. A royal priesthood. His own special people. That you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness. Called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Who, were, who once were not a people, but now are the people of God. Good morning, people of God. Are we here today, people of God? Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Believers in Christ are now the people of God. They are that nation that the kingdom was transferred to, irrespective of race. Irrespective of race, whether you're Jew, you're Israelite, whether you're Gentile, you are that nation, that holy nation. That special nation. Now the Apostle Paul, he tells us the same in Ephesians chapter 2. And Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verse 11, remember that you were once Gentiles in the flesh. You were once Gentiles, everybody. You were once Gentiles. Now we move to verse um, 12. 
that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise. You were. We were. Gentiles. We were aliens. We were strangers from the covenant of promise. And it says there, having no hope. And without God in the world, we had no hope. Without God in the world. How does that sound? But now. Terrible. But now, verse 13, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought, brought near by the blood of Christ. Amen. Don't worry about your what ifs. You have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Amen. Brought near to God. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one. Both who are one? Jew and Gentile. He has made us both one. Praise God. And we read on. And has broken down the middle wall of separation between Jew and Gentile, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself how many? One new man from the two, thus making him, thus making peace, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, therefore putting to death the enmity. We are one, the people of God, Jew and Gentile. That's clear. That we are one. But I want you to notice, I want you to notice something. The what if promise that the Israelites didn't keep. We look at the similarity between Exodus 19, 5 and 6, and 1 Peter 2, 9. And I've, I've made it easy for you. I've put colour matching here. So <laughs> let's look at the colour matching so you can see how uh, absolutely how they correspond so well. Look at it, Exodus 19, 5 and 6. The red part of Exodus 19, what does that say? Special a special treasure. treasure to me above all people. If they had obeyed Israel, a special treasure to me above all people. Now go to the red part of 1 Peter 2, 9. What does that say? His own, His own special, special people. people. <coughs> that's, that's the people of God today. Now let's look at the, let's look at the purple part. In Exodus 19, it promised if they obeyed, they'd be a kingdom of priests. What does it say that we are today in verse 9? Look at the purple part. A royal, royal priesthood. We are a royal priesthood. Don't worry about your, your what ifs, your royalty. Don't worry about your what ifs. And then we, we get one more, a blue. Can we match the blue? The promise to Israel there in Exodus 19, they would have been a holy nation was the promise. And exactly the same promise to us today, a holy nation. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, his own special people, a holy nation. That we may proclaim the praises of our God. Amen. John in Revelation 1.6, he confirms this as well. And he says in Revelation 1.6, and has made us kings. Priest. Hey, everybody. King. King Phil. He has made us King. priests, kings and priests to his God and his Father. To him be glory dominion. and dominion forever and ever. Amen. We're priests. That might come as a shock to you. Did you know that? You're a priest. If you're in Christ, you're a priest. Perhaps you thought, um, Judy, that only men could be priests. You're a priest. Perhaps you thought that you were not called to be a priest, Shannon. You've been called to be a priest. Maybe your parents, Max, didn't want you to be a priest. Maybe they wanted you to be a lawyer or a doctor or an engineer or anything but a priest. But Max, so you are a priest. <laughs> We're priests. Maybe you thought you'd never, you never wanted to be a priest. You never wanted to enter the priesthood because of the pressure of having to be holy. 
And all the people looking at you as a good example, well, sorry, you have entered the priesthood. You're a priest. You've got that pressure upon you. But just trust God, okay? Amen. Trust Him for the difficulty. I remember going to a church once, and I was very young, and, and I saw the, the priest outside the front of the church smoking a cigarette as all the young people and all the people were walking into the church. And in my mind, I thought, hey, that's not right. You're supposed to be an example. How do the parents feel about you smoking as their children are going into church? We're priests too. We have standards of righteousness to, to live out amongst other people. Too late if you don't want to be a priest, Val. Too late. You're a priest. If you're born again, you're a priest. Amen. We're priests, but we're not any kind of priest, Leslie. We're not any kind of priest. Guess what kind of priest you are if you are in Christ? You are a royal priest. Amen. Why are you a royal priest? Because you're related to the King, the King of Kings. Amen. We're a royal priest. And we're not just any, any kind of priest. We are holy priests. That is, remember, First Peter said, you are a holy priesthood, a royal priesthood. We are holy priests. So being royal priests, don't worry about your what ifs, your royalty. Whatever wrong turns you thought you might have made in your life, if you're in Christ, you're royalty. Related to the King of Kings. So brethren, that's clear, isn't it, who we are? Seeing that we are priests, brethren, do you think we need to understand what our role is as priests then? It's important that we know what our role is as priests of the Almighty. As priests of the Almighty God and Christ. What is our role? Firstly, I can tell you some things it doesn't mean. You're a priest and it don't expect... Uh, don't let anybody call you Father. Don't call me Father David because I'm a priest, okay? Don't call me that. And don't call anybody, the women here, Mother Superior or anything just because you're a priest. No, because the Bible says this in Matthew 23, 9. It says, do not call anyone on earth your father. In the spiritual sense, it's a spiritual father. Do not call anybody earth, on earth your Father, for one is your Father who is in heaven. heaven. Okay, so then this is one thing that being a priest is not about. Don't expect me as a priest either to give you penance for your sins. Don't expect me to do that. Don't expect me to give you absolution for your sins. You're a priest. I'm a priest. So we need to go to the high priest yeah. Amen. when we sin. We need to go to the high priest directly. And who is our high priest? Jesus, Jesus is our yeah. high priest Amen. who will speak to the only true Father on our behalf. Amen. But even Jesus and the Father yeah. they don't give penance to us for our sins. Penance is when you have to um, pay a price for what you've done wrong to make for it to be made up with God. That even they don't give us penance. They don't give us a punishment or anything to make up for the sin that we have done. God will forgive us our sins when we come to Him with repentant hearts. And we come through Christ. It's the blood of Christ that cleanses us from our sin. Not us having to make up for it by suffering or pain or penance to pay for what we've done. Christ paid. Amen. Fully. He paid for what we, we've done. He took the punishment, our punishment upon himself. So we can receive with our repentant hearts. We can receive forgiveness. So don't come to me as a priest for absolution or penance. Go to Christ. Amen. Go to God through Christ. Jesus, it says in the scripture, is the mediator yeah. between God and man. 
You don't have to come to my confession box. I don't have a confession box. <laughs> Even though I'm a priest and I don't want a confession box. Jesus is, is the high priest and he brings forgiveness. So what does it mean then to be a priest? Everybody, because you know you're, you're a priest. If it doesn't mean these things. <laughs> Holman Bible Dictionary, it defines a priest in this way. As persons in charge of sacrifice and offering at worship places, particularly in the temple. A priest as persons in charge of sacrifice and offering at worship places, particularly in the temple. You may wonder, <laughs> how does that help me to understand my role as a priest? I thought there was no temple anymore and, and no sacrifices. Think again. You are the temple. Yeah. You are you are the sacrifice, everybody. You are the sacrifice. You, you, you have to offer up the sacrifice. You are, as we read, what? Living sacrifices. So we have to understand then what this means because our role as a priest is, is very important because we're royal priests. So let, let's look at 1 Peter 2.5. It says there, Peter writes, you also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Christ. So this is what we have to do. We have to offer up spiritual sacrifices. So what are spiritual sacrifices? Well, let's look. Let's read on. 1 Peter 2.9, and we've had this verse already. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness, praise God, into his marvelous light. So there we see one thing about what it means to offer up spiritual sacrifices. We have to proclaim the praises of God and of Christ. And how do we do that? We can do it with our words, nice. proclaiming the praises. We can also do it with the way we live. Mm -hmm. That we, people don't come and, and to us and they, they see us living in a, in, a, in a way that is wrong, that is disrespectful to God, mm -hmm. that's not bringing Him praise. Like perhaps that... Well, that priest I saw smoking outside the front of this huge church. What a, what a bad witness for the, for the young people, for anyone. And so we must proclaim the praises of God by the way that we live. This is such an important part of us being priests. And we see another example of what a spiritual sacrifice is, 1 Peter 2.11, Beloved, I beg you, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul. That can be a huge spiritual sacrifice to us, to abstain from the fleshly lusts that that have ruled our lives, that have motivated us, the things that we've really enjoyed, that we lust after. A sacrifice is to abstain from them because they war against our souls. Mm. They want to take possession of us and our time, our affections, and they draw the, uh, take our time and our affections away from the one we're serving. The one we love with all our hearts and soul and mind and strength. That's the greatest commandment. And that's an example of a spiritual sacrifice. So why do priests need to do all of this, offering up spiritual sacrifices? What's the point of the role of us as priest Max and priest Rich and Cheryl? What's the point of, of offering up these spiritual sacrifices? 
Hebrews 5 gives us a little insight. Hebrews 5, 1 and 2, it says, when talking about the high priest in the Old Covenant, for every high priest taken from among men is appointed for men in things pertaining to God. Appointed for men. I think we can relate that. We are appointed for others. Not just ourselves. Okay? Appointed for men in things pertaining to God that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. This is part of our role. Offering gifts and sacrifices in our lives. And, and the priest did that to reconcile the people to God. Do we have gifts? Are we making spiritual sacrifices for others? Do we have gifts to share with others that are going to help them in that reconciliation process with God? We do have gifts from God. We are gifted in, with spiritual gifts. And we are, there are many sacrifices that God wants us to make for men so that they are drawn towards Christ, not, not away. And look at the next part. This priest can have compassion on those who are ignorant and going astray, since he himself is also subject to weakness. Brethren, as priests, do we have compassion? Do we share the gifts that we have? Do we make sacrifices for others with compassion so that they, God willing, will be reconciled to the lover of their souls, to the King of Kings? We're priests. We're royal priests. So don't worry about the what ifs. We have the most important responsibility in the world. We, we have the highest honor in the world. Don't worry about your what if I did that or what if I hadn't done that. Look where you are today. You're a royal priest. Amen. A holy nation. The key function of the priest was to stand between God and men. To reconcile with those sacrifices that they were offering. To reconcile the people to God by offering these sacrifices for, for sinful man to God. Are we making those sacrifices? Are we doing it compassionately and offering the gifts that we need to offer to help reconcile? That's our role as priests. To be used by Christ, with Christ in us, to reconcile people to God through Christ. Such an important role. Romans 12.1 Paul urges us, urges us, he says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Here is where I just want to expand on what it means to offer spiritual sacrifices. We're living sacrifice. We're not this animal that just once was killed and offered us a sacrifice. But our whole life is a sacrifice for God. And, and something that's really significant that comes through these verses is the sacrifice of holiness. God emphasizes so much here that we need to live holy lives and that's a sacrifice because when we live holy lives which we can only live through the Holy Spirit in us this is an everyday thing it's an every moment thing really because we don't want to be unholy at all God says, be holy as I am holy. I think also that's in 1 Peter. Is there a time when God is not holy? No. We are set apart, as the word holy means, we are set apart 
for righteousness. And that's a sacrifice because sometimes the, we are actually, as humans in our flesh, we are attracted, we know, to things that aren't holy. We are, at, and, and we have to sacrifice doing many things. We have to sacrifice things that are unholy. Would you like a water? Oh. <coughs> So we think of our lives as they must be lives that are obedient as Christians. We can't just be living for ourselves when we're priests. We have to live for others daily and obey God in everything. That's what we're called to as the royal priests. We're to be an example in righteousness and holiness. And that's not easy. It takes dedication. It takes commitment. But that's what we are called to. To be serving not ourselves, but to be loving our neighbours as ourselves. To be loving God with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength. Being a, a priest is really, really a challenge. So we need God's strength to do it. We need God. To be connected with God each and every moment of the day. To live out our calling as royal priests. Mm. Praise God. What a glorious calling that, that we, we, we have. Did you see, uh, as Angela did the reading, you might have missed this in verse 12. But let's look at verse 12. And it shows us how... This lifestyle that I have explained in part of being a, a, a offering up spiritual sacrifices holy and acceptable to God, it explains how it fulfills our key role of reconciling man to God. Verse 12 says this, and I think this relates to what Rich was sharing earlier. Having your conduct, verse 1 Peter 2, 12, having your conduct honourable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may be by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. Matthew 5, 16, Jesus says the same. Let your light so shine before men, that they may see your good works, your holy living is a big part of that. And glorify your Father in heaven. And again, Philippians 2.15, that you may become a blameless and harmless children of God, without fault, in the midst of this crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Do you see your spiritual sacrifices in these verses? This is our life now, priests. That's my life. It's your life. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. And did you know that all we're doing by doing this is we're following in the footsteps of Christ? 1 Peter 2, 21, 40. This you were called because Christ also suffered for us. And sacrifices involve suffering. Are you willing? Are you ready? Are you suffering for, for other people? Are you suffering for Christ? Are you suffering for God? Are you prepared to do that? This is our calling. For to this you are called. Because Christ also suffered for us. Leaving us an example that we should walk in His steps. And if it wasn't for the life of Christ. If it wasn't 
for His holiness and His holy sacrifice, we would be doomed. We would be doomed, as, as Mark, Matthew 10, 28 says, we would be doomed, we, our body and our soul, as Matthew 10, 28 says, would be destroyed in hell. Jesus is continuing this ministry of reconciliation through you and me, priests. And we are to offer up these spiritual sacrifices. Does anybody have a spiritual sacrifice, something that I haven't shared that you think was really important to share about what our spiritual sacrifice sacrifices are? If, Rich. Just while, while people think about that, um, just you mentioned earlier on that we are God's temple, but you didn't happen to have a reference for that. Mm -hmm. But in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 and 20, it says that. It says that we are a temple. Shall I just yeah. Okay, quickly. Thanks. Well, do you not know that your body is the dwelling place of the set apart spirit who is in you, which you have from Elohim, and you are not your own, for you are bought with a price. Mm -hmm. Therefore, esteem Elohim in your body and in your spirit, which are of Elohim. Amen, brethren. We are the temple of God. We don't want to be like those priests who turn people away from Christ. Those priests who abuse children, those priests who are after, after your money constantly. We don't want to be like those priests who, who are living hypocritical lives. That's who we don't want to be as priests. We want to be the priests that glorify God. You want to be the priest that offers up those holy and acceptable spiritual sacrifices which is our reasonable service that will see people glorify God that's the kind of priest I want to be and I pray that's the kind of priest you want to be because you're a priest it's too late you've accepted the calling there's no turning back but praise God don't worry about your what ifs say goodbye to your what ifs you have something so much better Jesus wants to continue his ministry of reconciliation through us to people who are broken, to people whose lives are headed nowhere, and also to the people of Israel. Look at these verses. He wants us to make the people of Israel who have turned from Him, He wants us to make them jealous so that they will turn back to, to Christ and turn to God and some of them will be saved. Look at Romans 11. Verse 13, For I speak to, to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry, if by any means, says the Apostle Paul, I may provoke to jealousy those who are my flesh, Israelites, and save yes. some of them. That's what he wanted to do. And then in verse 22, consider the goodness and the severity of God on those who fell, on the Israelites who fell. Severity, but toward you Gentiles, and now we're no longer Jew or Gentile, we're one in Christ, but, but at that time, but to you, toward you, goodness, if you continue in His goodness, otherwise you also will be cut off. And they also, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. God wants to use us as well in reconciling the Israelites back to God. Praise Him. So that their big what if can be put behind them. They were promised, as we saw, to be a holy nation, a special people. They can be, enjoy that promise again. God wants to use you, brethren. Your what-ifs won't matter if you come to Christ because there's nothing better than what you have today. 
So, so as I close the message, I could do a really unusual altar call. Um, I don't think I'll do that one, but I could make an altar call to somebody. If you're not a priest, and you want to be a priest, if you're listening to, to what I'm saying today, if you want to be a priest, you want to be a royal priest, a holy priest, come to Christ. Amen. Come to the high priest. He'll make you a priest. I don't know if anybody's ever made an altar call like that before. Come and be a priest. But I also want to make one last call for any of us. And we can pray about this. If you want to come forward today for prayer, if you've not realized that you are a priest, or you've lost sight of the fact of that you are a priest and what your role is as a priest, may you come forward and receive prayer that God will keep you on that path, of that direction, that narrow path that we are on as priests and that He will use you in the reconciliation of many souls to Him through Christ. Amen. Anybody want to come forward after the song? You come forward and we'll pray that God will make you a priest who is focused on the role of the priesthood to His honour, to His glory. Amen. Amen. Let's close with the song Nothing But The Blood. Nothing but the blood. That's what reconciles us to God. And we have to preach the blood of Christ, the good news that Jesus died and rose again. Amen. And that's our salvation. That's where we get forgiveness from. Praise and praise. Let's stand, let's sing. Nothing but the blood. Nothing but the blood.
Are there anyone, anybody who's not a priest, who wants to be a priest, a royal priest, then consider the message today, and even now, turn to Christ, confess your sins, repent, believe, trust in Him, put your trust in Him, and walk this wonderful ministry out of being a royal priest. If there's anybody here, put your hand up if you feel like, hey, you, you've forgotten that you're a priest, or you didn't really know what being a priest involved, and, and found some enlightenment today about, and, and, and some focus and to get for your life, understanding that you are a priest and that you want to serve out your ministry and your calling as a priest. Put your hand up if you want prayer or come forward and we'll pray for you individually, specifically by name.